One of the first things that really drew me to math was prime numbers, and I don't think I'm alone in that. Prime numbers are kind of mysterious in a lot of ways, especially the first time you hear about them. Most people learn about prime numbers immediately after some basic arithmetic, and unlike a lot of other things you've learned in arithmetic, prime numbers don't really follow a lot of patterns. They kind of seem to move on their own and act in strange and unpredictable ways. So when we come across a proof or a theorem about prime numbers that's understandable, it's a really interesting thing to dive into. So today I want to talk about Fermat's little theorem. It's a theorem about prime numbers, and it's called little just so that we can distinguish it from Fermat's last theorem. The theorem goes like this. Suppose we have a number p that we suppose might be prime, and we want to test it. Well, we'll pick a positive integer a, and we'll put a to the power of p. We will then subtract a from that quantity, and Fermat's little theorem states that this quantity will be evenly divisible by p if p is a prime number. Now, the very first time I heard this, I was reasonably a little bit surprised. I mean, this is remarkably simple, and yet prime numbers tend to be sporadic and unpredictable. So, it got me thinking there must be a simple geometric visual way to understand this theorem. So that's what I want to talk about in this video, breaking down this theorem to the point where it seems obvious that this must be a true statement. So let's imagine we have a collection of red and blue dots and three boxes to put them in. We can arrange these dots in any configuration we can come up with, even if that configuration is just three dots of the same color. A reasonable question to ask now is, how many different configurations can we come up with? To start off, let's just look at that first box and realize that our only two options are either a red dot or a blue dot. So we're going to construct a tree of different possibilities. So let's represent these choices with a red and a blue dot over here on the side. In the second box, we can either put a red or a blue dot and we'll represent this as our first options branching off into either a red or a blue dot. In the third box, we can also either put a red or a blue dot, and we'll represent this as having our branches split off one more time. At this point, finding out the total number of configurations is just as easy as counting up however many final branches we have. So we've got eight different possibilities. But let's make sure we understand how we got that number. It was because for our first box we had two possibilities, and then our second box gave us two more possibilities from each of those, so we multiplied it by two. And then our third box gave us two more possibilities, so we multiplied our configurations by two again, leaving us with two times two times two, or just two cubed. As a gut check, let's make sure we know what will happen if we add a fourth box. Well, in this fourth box, we'll again be able to add either a red or a blue dot, which means all of our options branch off one more time into a red or a blue. This multiplies our options again by two, so now we have two times two times two times two, or just two to the fourth. So now let's see what happens if we were to add some more colors in. Let's add in some green dots to our possible dots that we can put in these boxes, and see what that changes for option one. Well, now we can put in there either a red, blue, or a green dot, which means over here on the left, we're gonna have to include an option that is selecting a green dot. Continuing with the same game we were playing earlier, the second box can take either a red, blue, or green dot, so we'll have each of these dots split off into those three options. And then the third box splits our options again into a red, green, or blue. And we now have 27 different configurations, because the first box gave us three options, the second box multiplied all of our options by three, and the third box multiplied our options by three again, leaving us with three cubed, or 27. And now we can come up with an expression for the number of possibilities. It's the number of colors raised to the power of the number of boxes that we have, or number of dots in our string. And now, if we call the number of colors A and the number of boxes P, we're already getting something that looks kind of like Fermat's little theorem. But we're missing that minus A. Where is that going to come in? What does it mean to subtract A from this quantity? We'll get to why we're subtracting that A, but for now we need to focus our attention on a kind of different variation on this puzzle we've been playing. 
So let's now give ourselves the ability to do something called shifting. It's where we're going to take the last dot in that sequence and move it to the front and shift every other dot over to the right by one. We can now ask the question, how many different possible arrangements can we construct just by shifting? And we'll notice that well, we can only shift three times, and we know that for two dots of length three, we've got more possibilities than just three. And we can come up really easily with one of the strings that we're missing. It's this one right here. Okay, so now let's try imagining shifting this three times. We can shift this other sequence around a couple times to construct the other possible arrangements. And notice that I am leaving off the strings of all red and all blue, and that'll become more apparent why I'm doing that later, so keep it in the back of your minds. Next, let's notice that if we take one of these strings, we can only shift it two times before we get back our original string. And that kind of begs the question, for which starting strings will this be the case? What conditions go into whether or not a string will cycle back around to itself over a certain number of shifts? Let's play around with some more starting strings and see if that illuminates the question. Let's start off with this string, red, red, blue, blue. We've now got four dots, but still just two colors. Well, we can shift it once to get this, another time to get this, and one more time to get this sequence. But notice that if we shift it another time, we will get back the original string. So much like the string of length three, this thing repeats itself if we shift it four times. Now let's try playing the same game, but with this sequence, red, blue, red, blue. If we shift it once, we'll see that we get blue, red, blue, red. But notice that if we shift it again, we get back the original string. So this one got back to its original configuration after just two shifts. Let's take a look at this string and try to figure out why exactly that is. When we look a little bit closer at this string, we realize that there's something unique about it. It's that a sub-piece of this string repeats itself. We have red-blue, then red-blue. This means that upon shifting the string twice, what we're effectively doing is just swapping those two substrings around. And so you end up with the same thing you started with since those two substrings are identical. And note, this won't just happen for strings of an even length. We can pick a length of nine and we can also pick more colors. We could have red, green, and blue. Now, I know this string kind of looks like a mess, but trust me, it's not as bad as it looks because within the string, we have substrings that repeat themselves. Notice that we've got red, blue, green, then red, blue, green, then red, blue, green. So we're expecting something to happen similar to what happened with our four dots in the last example. And sure enough, if we shift it once, we'll get this, then another time and we get this, and then a third time, and we're back to where we started. So even though this has nine dots in it, it's periodic after just three shifts. We can therefore come to the conclusion that the periodicity of these strings is related to whether or not we can find substrings that repeat themselves within the larger string. And maybe at this point you're already starting to see where prime numbers are gonna come into this, but if not, let's see another example, but let's choose five dots. So take a look at the string we have right here. In the previous examples, we were able to look at the string before we started shifting and determine that there were certain substrings that repeated themselves a couple times. And that was what allowed us to shift it less than the total length of the string and get back the original string we started with. But notice, five is a prime number. So we could try grouping it with three at the beginning, but we're gonna be left with two at the end and then an empty space. So we won't be able to group it in groups of three. We could try two, but then you're gonna be left with one left over at the end again. And the very nature of a prime number is that it can't be grouped in this way. This is just a visual representation of what divisibility means. And as a result of the fact that we can't identify any smaller substrings within the larger string, we'll be able to shift this string into five different versions, each of which is unique. We now have the tools to understand Fermat's Little Theorem. 
So let's go back to our string of length three with two different colors and construct the two strings that can't be made into each other by shifting. We saw earlier that each of these starting strings can be shifted twice to construct a total of three different strings. And we now know why that is. It's because three is a prime number. And now notice that because each of these strings we started with shifted into a total of three different configurations, we'll be able to organize all of our configurations into three equal groups. Now we do need to ignore the strings that are all of the same color, but that's actually something we already knew. Notice that for a certain amount of different colors that we're using, we'll have exactly that amount of strings that are all of the same color. So for two different colors, we'll have one string of all red and one string of all blue. And for A different colors, we'll have A strings that are all of the same color. So we can now read this statement as saying A to the P, our total number of possible configurations, minus A, all of the configurations that have the same color. And this quantity is divisible by P, which in this case is three because each of our starting strings splits into three different configurations. So now let's see what happens if we choose a number of dots in our string that is not prime. Let's choose a string of length four with two different colors. First, let's construct all of the different strings that can't be made into each other by shifting. Now, let's see what happens if we start shifting each of these strings into other unique strings. This first string will shift once to give us this, twice to give us something else, and it ends up that this first string can generate four different unique strings. This third string can also be shifted three different times to construct four unique strings. And this last one is the same. We can shift it three times to get four unique strings. But take a look at that second string. We saw it earlier. It only shifts one time before it starts to repeat itself again. This means that if we try to group the configurations like we did earlier, the first two groups will have four configurations, but the other ones will only have three. So this won't divide into four equal groups. Two of the groups have four configurations in it, and the other ones have three. And so the fact that we get some columns of four and some columns of three means that the quantity a to the p minus a, the total number of configurations, is not guaranteed to be divisible by p which in this case is four. So just to summarize, a string with a prime number length will always be able to be shifted into that prime number of different strings, regardless of the number of colors that we have. As a result, once we've collected all of the strings of a certain length that cannot be made into one another by shifting, we know that each one of them will be able to shift into p different configurations of themselves and therefore the total number of configurations will be divisible by p so long as we subtract the configurations that all have the same color, like all green or all red or all blue. And that's taken care of by the minus a. So I hope you guys liked this video. Fermat's little theorem is something I learned a while ago, but I never had any kind of intuition behind it. So as soon as I learned about this way to visualize Fermat's little theorem, I just had to make a video on it. And I'd like to link the video that gave me the idea to animate this visualization in the first place. It's a video by Khan Academy posted in the early 2010s and I'd really recommend you guys go check it out. So with that said, that's it for this video and thanks for watching.